interesting seahorse and I'm sorry if you can hear my squeaky chair I still haven't managed to find one that isn't squeaky and doesn't get in the way of the green screen I hope it doesn't bother you too much um, but I do tend to gesticulate when I talk a little bit and that can make the chair a little bit creaky now if you have something you'd like me to whisper about please tell me in the comments because I do read every single comment I use YouTube studio I go down to the bottom and I make sure that I've responded to each one um, so it's easier when you make new comments as well um, yeah anyway so please tell me if you have any ideas if you don't want to comment publicly you can message me on any of my various social media which you will find in the description and now with that long preamble out of the way let's commence this whispering wikipedia please remember i don't know how to pronounce scientific terminology or scientific names so i'm sorry if you are a marine biologist sea horse also written c dash horse and c space horse is the name given to 46 species of most small marine fish in the genus hippocampus hippocampus comes from the ancient greek hippocampos itself from hippos meaning horse and campos meaning sea monster makes sense i guess having a head and neck suggestive of a horse seahorses also feature segmented bony armor an upright posture and a curled prehensile tail along with the pipe fishes and sea dragons they form the order sign day moving to their habitat seahorses are mainly found in shallow tropical and temperate salt water throughout the world they live in sheltered areas such as seagrass beds estuaries coral reefs and mangroves four species are found in pacific waters from north america South America. In the Atlantic, Hippocampus erectus ranges from Nova Scotia to Uruguay. H. Zosestra, known as the dwarf seahorse, is found in the Bahamas. Colonies have been found in European waters such as the Thames estuary. Three species live in the Mediterranean Sea. H. Gutulus, the long snouted seahorse. H. Hippocampus, the short snouted seahorse, and H. Fuscus, the sea pony. That's cute. These species form territories. Males stay within one square meter or ten square feet of habitat, while females range over about one hundred times that. Interesting. Moving to their description. Seahorses range in size from 1.5 to 35 centimeters, which is 3 8 to 14 inches. That's a really big difference. And a 14 inch seahorse, a 35 centimeter one, is actually quite large. They are named for their equine appearance with bent necks and long snouted heads and a distinctive trunk and tail. Although they are bony fish, they do not have scales but rather have thin skin stretched over a series of bony plates which are arranged in rings throughout their bodies. The armor of bony plates also protects them against predators and because of this outer skeleton they no longer have ribs. Seahorses swim upright, propelling themselves using the dorsal fin, another characteristic not shared by their close piper fish relatives, which swim horizontally. Razor fish are the only other fish that swim vertically. The pectoral fins located on either side of the head behind their eyes are used for steering. They lack the caudal fin, typical of fishes. Their prehensile tail is composed of square-like rings that can be unlocked only in the most extreme conditions. They are adept at camouflage. 
camouflage and can grow and reabsorb spiny appendages depending on their habitat. Unusually among fish, a seahorse has a flexible, well-defined neck. It also sports a crown-like spine or horn on its head termed a coronet, which is distinct for each species. Seahorses swim very poorly, rapidly fluttering a dorsal fin and using pectoral fins to steer. The slowest moving fish in the world is H. Zosestri, the dwarf seahorse, with a top speed of about 1.5 meters, which is 5 feet per hour. Dang. Since they are poor swimmers, they are most likely to be found resting with their prehensile tail wound around a stationary object. They have long snouts, which they can use to suck up their food and their eyes can move independently of each other, like those of a chameleon. Wow. Moving to evolution and fossil record. Anatomical evidence supported by molecular, physical and genetic evidence demonstrates that seahorses are highly modified pipe fish. The fossil record of seahorses, however, is very sparse. The best known and best studied fossils are specimens of Hippocampus cutellatus. The literature more commonly refers to them under the synonym H. remolosus. From the Marecchia River formation of Rimi Province, Italy, dating back to the lower Pliocene about three million years ago. The earliest known seahorse fossils are of two pipefish-like species. H. Sarmaticus and H. Slovenicus from the Colprolytic horizon of Dungeous Hills, a middle Miocene lagostate in Slovenia, dating back about 13 million years. Molecular dating finds that pipefish and seahorses diverged during the late Oligocene. This has led to speculation that seahorses evolved in response to large areas of shallow water, newly created as the result of tectonic events. The shallow water would have allowed the expansion of seagrass habitats that selected for the camouflage offered by the seahorses' upright posture. These tectonic changes occurred in the western Pacific Ocean, pointing to an origin there with molecular data, suggesting two later separate invasions of the Atlantic Ocean. In 2016, a study published in Nature found the seahorse genome to be the most rapidly evolving fish genome studied so far. Interesting. Moving to reproduction. The male seahorse is equipped with a pouch on the ventral or front-facing side of the tail. When mating, the female seahorse deposits up to 15,000 eggs in the male's pouch. The male carries the eggs for 9 to 45 days until the seahorses emerge fully developed, but very small. The young are then released into the water and the male often mates again within hours or days during the breeding season. Let's talk about their courtship. Before breeding, seahorses may court for several days. Scientists believe that courtship behavior synchronizes the animal's movements and reproductive states so that the male can receive the eggs when the female is ready to deposit them. Ah, interesting. During this time, they may change color swim side by side, holding tails, or grip the same strand of seagrass with their tails, and wheel around in unison in what is known as a pre-dawn dance. That's so cute. They eventually engage in a true courtship dance, lasting about eight hours, during which the male pumps water through the egg pouch on his trunk, which expands and opens to display its emptiness. When the female's eggs reach maturity, she and her mate let go of any anchors and dripped upward snout 
the snout out of the seagrass, often spiraling as they rise. They interact for about six minutes, reminiscent of courtship. The female then swims away until the next morning, and the male returns to sucking up food through his snout. Female inserts her ovipositor into the male's brood pouch and deposits dozens to thousands of eggs. As the female releases her eggs, her body slims while his swells. Both animals then sink back into the seagrass and she swims away. Now, let us talk about phases of courtship. Seahorses exhibit four phases of courtship that are indicated by clear behavioral changes and changes in intensity of the courtship act. Phase one, the initial courtship phase, typically takes place in the early morning, one or two days before physical copulation. During this phase, the potential mates brighten in color, quiver, and display rapid side-to-side -side body vibrations. These displays are performed alternatively by both the male and the female seahorse. The following phase 2 through 4 happen sequentially on the day of copulation. Phase 2 is marked by the female pointing, a behavior in which the female will raise her head to form an oblique angle with her body. In phase 3, males will also begin the same pointing behavior in response to the female. Finally, the male and female will repeatedly rise upward together in a water column and end in mid-water copulation in which the females will transfer her eggs directly into the male's brood pouch. Now, in phase 1, initial courtship. The initial courtship behavior takes place about 30 minutes after dawn on each courtship day, until the day of copulation. During this phase, the males and females will remain apart during the night, but after their dawn, they will come together in a side-by-side -side position, brighten, and engage in courtship behavior for about 2 to 38 minutes. There is repeated reciprocal quivering. This starts with the male approaching the female and brightens and begins to quiver. The female will follow the male with her own display in which she will also brighten and quiver for about five seconds. As the male quivers, he will rotate his body towards the female who will then rotate her body away. During phase one, the tails of both seahorses are positioned within one centimeter of each other on the same hold fast, and both of their bodies are angled slightly outwards from the point of attachment. However, the female will shift her tail attachment side, causing the pair to circle their common hold fast. Phase 2. Pointing and Pumping. This phase begins with the female beginning her pointing posture by leaning her body towards the male, who will simultaneously lean away and quiver. This phase can last for up to 54 minutes. Following phase 2 is a latency period, typically between 30 minutes and 4 hours, during which the seahorses display no courtship behavior, and females are not bright. Males will usually display a pumping motion with their body. Now to pointing, pointing, phase three. The third phase begins with the females brightening and assuming the pointing position. The males respond with their own brightening and pointing display. This phase ends with the male departing. It usually lasts nine minutes and can occur one to six times during courtship. Now moving to phase 4, rising and copulation. The final courtship phase includes 5 to 8 bouts of courtship. Each bout of courtship begins with both the male and female anchored to the same plant, and about 
three of the seahorses will rise upward together anywhere from 2 to 13 centimeters in a water column. During the final rise, the female will insert her ovipositor and transfer her eggs through an opening in the male's brood pouch. Now we move to fertilization. During fertilization in Hippocampus Cuda, the brood pouch was found to be open for only six seconds while egg deposition occurred. During this time, seawater entered the pouch where the spermatozoa and eggs met in a seawater milieu. This hyperosmotic environment facilitates sperm activation and motility. The fertilization is therefore regarded as being physiologically external with a physically internal environment after the closure of the pouch. It is believed that this protected form of fertilization reduces sperm competition among males. Within the Psychonathidae, the pipefishes and seahorses protected fertilization has not been documented in the pipefishes, but the lack of any distinct differences in the relation of testes size to body size suggests that pipefishes may also have evolved mechanisms for more efficient fertilization with a reduced sperm competition. We move now to gestation. The fertilized eggs are then embedded in the pouch wall and become surrounded by a spongy tissue. The male supplies the eggs with prolactin, the same hormone responsible for milk production in pregnant mammals. The pouch provides oxygen as well as a controlled environment incubate. Though the egg yolk contributes nourishment to the developing embryo, the male seahorses contribute additional nutrients such as energy-rich lipids and also calcium to allow them to build their skeletal system by secreting them into the brood pouch that are absorbed by the embryos. Further, they also offer immunological protection, osmoregulation, gas exchange and waste transport. The eggs then hatch in the pouch where the salinity of the water is regulated. This prepares the newborns for life in the sea. Throughout gestation, which in most species requires two to four weeks, his mate visits him daily for morning greetings. Now we move to birth. The number of young released by the male seahorse averages 100 to 1,000 for most species, but may be as low as 5 for the smaller species, or as high as 2,500. When the fry are ready to be born, the male expels them with muscular contractions. He typically gives birth at night and is ready for the next batch of eggs by morning when his mate returns. Like almost all other fish species, seahorses do not nurture their young after birth. Infants are susceptible to predators or ocean currents, which wash them away from feeding grounds or in temperatures too extreme for their delicate bodies. Less than 0.5% of infants survive to adulthood, explaining why litters are so large. These survival rates are actually fairly high compared to other fish because of their protected gestation, making this process worth the great cost to her father. The eggs of most other fish are abandoned immediately after fertilization. Now we move to reproductive roles. Reproduction is energetically costly to the male. This brings into question why the sexual role reversal even takes place. In an environment where one partner incurs more energy costs than the other, Bateman's principle suggests that the lesser contributor takes the role of the aggressor. Male seahorses are more aggressive and sometimes fight for female attention. According to Amanda Vincent of Project Seahorse, only males tail wrestle and snap their heads at each other. This discovery prompted further discovery of energy costs. To estimate the female's direct contribution, researchers chemically analyzed the energy stored in each egg. To measure the burden on the male's oxygen consumption was used. By the end of incubation, the male consumed about 33% more oxygen than before mating. The study concluded that the female's energy expenditure while generating eggs is twice that of males during incubation confirmed the standard hypothesis. Interesting. While the male 
Seahorse and other members of the Cygnet 38. Carries the offspring through gestation is unknown, though some research believe it allows for shorter birthing intervals, in turn resulting in more offspring. Given an unlimited number of ready and willing partners, males have the potential to produce 17% more offspring than females in a breeding season. Also, females have timeouts from the reproductive cycle 1.2 times longer than those of males. This seems to be based on mate choice rather than physiology. When the female's eggs are ready, she must lay them in a few hours or eject them into the water column. Making eggs is a huge cost to her physically, since they amount to about a third of her body weight. To protect against losing her clutch, the female demands a long courtship. The daily greetings help to cement the bond between the pair. Moving to monogamy. Though seahorses are not known to mate for life, many species form pair bonds that last through at least the breeding season. Some species show a higher level of mate fidelity than others. However, many species readily switch mates when the opportunity arises. H. abdominalis and H. brevisopes have been shown to breed in groups, showing no continuous mate preference. Many more species mating habitats have not been studied, so it is unknown how many species are actually monogamous or how long those bonds actually last. Although monogamy within fish is not common, it does appear to exist for some. In this case, the mate guarding hypothesis may be an explanation. This hypothesis states, males remain with a single female because of ecological factors that make male parental care and protection of offspring especially advantageous. Because the rates of survival of the newborn seahorses are so low, incubation is essential. Though not proven, males could have taken on this role because of the lengthy period the females require to produce their eggs. If males incubate while females prepare the next clutch, amounting to a third of body weight, they can reduce the interval between clutches. Now we move to feeding habitats. Seahorses use their long snouts to eat their food with ease. However, they are slow to consume their food and have extremely simple digestive systems that lack a stomach. So they must eat constantly to stay alive. Seahorses are not very good swimmers and for this reason they need to anchor themselves to seaweed, coral or anything else that will anchor the seahorses in place. They do this by using their prehensile tails to grasp their object of choice. Seahorses feed on small crustaceans floating in the water or crawling on the bottom. With excellent camouflage, seahorses ambush prey that floats within striking range, sitting and waiting until an optimal moment. Mycid shrimp and other small crustaceans are favourites, but some seahorses have been observed eating other kinds of invertebrates and even a larval fish. In study of seahorses, the distinctive head morphology was found to give them a hydrodynamic advantage that creates minimal interference while approaching an evasive prey. Thus, the seahorses can get very close to the copepods on which it preys. After successfully closing in on the prey without alerting it, the seahorse gives an upward thrust and rapidly rotates the head. Aided by large tendons that store and release elastic energy to bring its long snout close to the prey. This step is crucial for prey capture as oral suction only works at a close range. This two-phase prey capture mechanism is termed pivot feeding. Seahorses have three distinctive feeding phases.
phases preparatory, expansive and recovery. During this preparatory phase the seahorse slowly approaches the prey while in upright position after which it slowly flexes its head ventrally. In the expansive phase the seahorse captures its prey by simultaneously elevating its head, expanding the buccal cavity and sucking in the prey item. During the recovery phase the jaws, head and hyoid apparatus of the seahorse return to their original positions. The amount of available cover influences seahorse feeding behavior. For example, in wild areas with small amounts of vegetation, seahorses will sit and wait, but an environment with extensive vegetation will prompt the seahorse to inspect its environment. Feeding while swimming rather than sitting and waiting, conversely, in an aquarium setting with little vegetation, the seahorses will fully inspect its environment and makes no attempt to sit and wait. Now we move to threats of extinction. Because data is lacking on the sizes of the various seahorse populations as well as other issues including how many seahorses are dying each year how many are being born and the number used for souvenirs. There is insufficient information to assess their risk of extinction and the risk of losing more seahorses remains a concern. Some species such as the paradoxical seahorse H. paradoxus may already be extinct. Coral reefs and seagrass beds are deteriorating, reducing viable habitats for seahorses. Additionally, bycatch in many areas causes high cumulative effects on seahorses, with an estimated 37 million individuals being removed annually over 21 countries. Wow. Now we move to aquaria. While many aquarium hobbyists keep them as pets, seahorses collected from the wild tend to fare poorly in home aquaria. Many eat only live foods such as brine shrimp and are prone to stress which damages their immune systems and makes them susceptible to disease. In recent years, however, captive breeding has become more popular. Such seahorses survive better in captivity and are less likely to carry diseases. They eat frozen mycetidae, which are crustaceans, that are readily available from aquarium stores and do not experience the stress of moving out of the wild. Although captive breeding seahorses are more expensive, they take no toll on wild populations. So if you're looking to get a seahorse, you know what to get. Seahorses should be kept in an aquarium with a low flow and placid tank mates. They are slow feeders, so fast aggressive feeders will leave them without food. Seahorses can coexist with many species of shrimp and other bottom feeding creatures. Gobies also make good tank mates. Keepers are generally advised to avoid eels, tangs, dragonfish, squid, octopus and sea anemones. Water quality is very important for the survival of a seahorse in an aquarium. They are delicate species which should not be added to a new tank. A water quality problem will affect fish behavior and can be shown by clamped fins, reducing feeding, erratic swimming and gasping at the surface. Seahorses swim up and down as well as using the length of the aquarium. Therefore the tanks should be ideally twice as deep as the length of the adult seahorse. Animals sold as freshwater seahorses are usually closely related to pipe fish, of which a few species live in lower reaches of rivers. The supposed true freshwater seahorse, H. Amy, is not a valid species but a synonym sometimes used for barbers and hedgehog seahorses. The latter, which is often confused with the former, can be found in estuarine environments but is not actually a freshwater fish. Now their use 
use in Chinese medicine. Seahorse populations are thought to be endangered as a result of overfishing and habitat destruction. Despite a lack of scientific studies or clinical trials, the consumption of seahorses is widespread in traditional Chinese medicine, primarily in connection with impotence, wheezing, nocturnal enuresis and pain, as well as labor induction. Up to 20 million seahorses may be caught each year to be sold for such uses. So, as always with the different animal species we research, there seems to be a running theme with Chinese medicine to be bad for the environment, a waste of money, and not effective at treating what they believe it treats. So, of course, if you are supporting or know anyone that supports the industry in any way, please heavily discourage them from doing so. Preferred species of sea horses include H. Kaloki, H. Hystrix, H. Kuda, H. Trimacultus, and H. Mohiniki. Sea horses are also consumed by Indonesians, Central Filipinos, and many other ethnic groups. Doesn't exactly say why they do it, though. Um, so maybe it's a food thing, like in general food, or maybe it is, uh, their also personal, uh, cultural beliefs about medicine. Import and export of seahorses has been controlled under sites since the 15th of May 2004. However, Indonesia, Japan, Norway, and South Korea have chosen to opt out of the trade rule set by sites. I wonder why that is. One day we should probably read the site's Wikipedia as we do end up reading about the memes. The problems may be exacerbated by the growth of pills and capsules as the preferred method of ingesting seahorses. Pills are cheaper and more available than traditionally individually tailored prescriptions of whole seahorses. But the contents are harder to track. Seahorses once had to be a certain size and quality before they were accepted by TCM practitioners and consumers. Declining availability of the preferred large, pale and smooth seahorses has been offset by a shift towards pre-packaged preparations, which makes it possible for TCM merchants to sell previously unused or otherwise undesirable juvenile spiny and dark colored animals. Today, almost a third of the seahorses sold in China are packaged, adding to the pressure on the species. To ride seahorse retails from 600 US dollars to 3000 US dollars per kilogram, with larger, paler and smoother animals commanding the highest prices. In terms of value based on weight, seahorses retail for more than the price of silver and almost that of gold in Asia. Now, um, we move to pygmy seahorses. Pygmy seahorses are the members of the genus that are less than 15 millimeters tall and 17 millimeters wide. Most pygmy seahorses are well camouflaged and live in close association with other organisms, including colonial hydrozoans, coralline algae, and sea fans. This, combined with their small size, accounts for why most species have only been noticed and classified since 2001. So, very interesting read again. Thank you so much to whoever suggested this to me. Again, as um, I talked about before, and as I seem to be talking about in an increasingly large amount, there is a running theme throughout all of our nature Wikipedia readings that there, of course, is a growing uh, rate of extinction um, due to a various amount of things such as climate change and also uh, uh, pseudoscientific practices like traditional Chinese medicine. So, um, if you know anyone involved in anything that is uh, negatively hurting the environment or immoral, like, um, you know, traditional 
Chinese medicine practices involving animals. Please use whatever influence you have to positively affect the world and tell them not to pursue unscientific and frankly unethical or immoral uh, things like that. And thank you so much for listening. It was so interesting to learn about the seahorse and their extremely complicated mating behaviors. Um, that section seemed to go on for ages, and it's quite interestingly that evolution has brought them to a place of such complex sexual behaviors and courtship behaviors, because it seems like, you know, to me, when I think about animal mating, I think of efficiency being, um, you know, quick mating that's over quickly that allows the male to spread his maximum amount of genetics, but it seems that the most advantage in this specific situation for evolution to muster up a certain behavior has been a really complicated one. Anyway, thank you so much for listening.